Friends, good morning. Boy, the kids are always so much more enthusiastic. I gotta say, let's try again. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the house of the Lord today. So glad to have you here as we worship God together today. As we're gonna begin with always a few announcements, I wanna call your attention to a few things I'm trying to do. Um, I'd like to try people start wearing name tags so we can get to learn each other's names a little better. There is one in your bulletin. I encourage you to put that on if you don't have a magnetic one out there. And also you can sign up for one of those magnetic ones by completing the insert that's in your bulletin each week. I'm also trying to get us in the habit of dropping this in the offering plate when it comes around. You can put hymn requests on there or prayer concerns or anything like that. Make sure we have your information but it encourages people to drop something in the offering plate as that comes as passed around as well. So if you can do that, if you need a name tag, a permanent name tag, you can request one on that also. So I'm trying to get people to start doing those two things, if you would please, in worship. Friends, other announcements, let's call your attention to the slide behind me. Do we have those or are we not because of the internet? Okay, we can try to show that then again. So Trunk or Treat is coming up next Sunday, friends. There is an insert again in your bulletin about Trunk or Treat. And we need new people to help out with that because again, we had like 800 people that came for Trunk or Treat. So we need people to pass out candy. You can bring a car. If you don't want to decorate, we have things we can decorate your car with. And there's lots of things needed for Trunk or Treat you can see on the insert in your bulletin this morning. Our candy. We need people to help with hot dogs and things like that, to prep those ahead of time, to serve and help clean them afterwards. You can see that sign-up list that's in your bulletin this morning. There's lots of ways to help. Is there anything else we need to say about this, Stephanie? Hi, guys. Good morning. Thank you all for volunteering, and we're going to get lots and lots of volunteers. Um, I just wanted to give a quick... Um, arrival time. Anyone going to help in the kitchen? If you could be here between 3.30 and 4. Lot help no later than 4. Trunks no later than 4.30. An inside help and welcome crew no later than 4.30. And if we could have any donated items by Wednesday so I can go shop for what we don't have. That would be great. And remember, like 800 community members, guys. This is an amazing outreach and the kids love it. And it's so fun to watch the kids just run around and be kids. So thank you all for all that you've done and we appreciate you all. Thank you, Stephanie. So that is next Sunday. We're trying to get ready for that for next Sunday. If you can help again, that insert is in your bulletin. If you can mark something there and drop it in the offering plate or give it to Stephanie after the service, that would be very helpful. Um, it saves us phone calls and shopping and all that kind of stuff if we know people are going to be bringing stuff ahead of time or helping out ahead of time. Friends, you can see all the, in, all, the, all the announcements that are in your bulletin this morning. Our internet is down this morning, so we won't have the worship slides and things. We'll be using those uh, books called hymnals and that kind of stuff this morning for some things. But um, our, the internet is down this morning from the storm, so we won't have the worship slides today. Are there other announcements we need to make? All right, friends, and I encourage you to take a minute and stand up if you're able, please, and give someone a handshake or a hug and welcome them to the house of the Lord today. Friends, I invite you to remain standing if you're able as you return to your places this morning. Please remain standing if you're able as you return to your places today. And I can't apologize. We won't have the words on the slides for you this morning. The internet is down this morning. If you know the words, you're welcome to sing along or just listen. As from the ground, it leads us in come now is the time to worship.
Friends, would you pray with me, please? Lord, our God, we have indeed come here to worship you this morning, to come away from this world with all its problems and all its busy schedule for just a little while and be in this place and open up ourselves to you and hear you speak to us and feel your presence here among us and within us. So, Lord, we come here to worship you. Fill this place in each of us with your spirit to overflowing. So we go out in this world, it can overflow from us into this world that needs your love and spirit so much. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, you may be seated.
Amen, friends. We're going to continue to talk about, as we did last week, about listening to God today. And so that song, Gentle Voice, about listening to God's voice. Friends, um, we have some more people who are going to be joining our church today. Not everyone could be here last Sunday and invite those who are going to join our church to come forward at this time. Congregation, you will need to open your hymnals to page 38. We'll have to use those books in front of us, those things called the hymnals, because uh, we don't have those words on your screen this morning as the internet is down. So if those who are joining the church this morning would please come forward at this time. Now I'm going to have you stand up here and face the congregation, please. And kids and everybody can come up with you, as we said before. They're welcome to do that. And friends, I'll be asking you some words out of the hymnal, and then I'll say, if so, please say, I do. And then, if so, please say, I will. And then I'll have you introduce yourselves, as we just said last week. So, congregation, you'll be on page 38 with me in just a moment. So in just a moment. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin. And so please answer, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And so please answer, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And so please answer, I do. congregation I'm now on the top of page 38 as members of Christ Universal Church will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries and so please answer I will as members of this congregation will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers your presence your gifts and your service if so please answer I will congregation on the bottom of 38 now members of the household of God I commend these persons to your love and care do all in your power to increase their faith Confirm their hope and perfect them in love. Would you please read with me? We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayer, our presence, our gifts, and our service. Then everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'm going to pass the microphone down, allow you to introduce yourselves, your families, and just say something that you enjoy about being part of our church. I'm Bruce Massar. Uh, about a year ago, I'm, you know, I'm, getting the, I'm getting the welcome in the back there. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> um, about a year ago, we got here, and it's been nothing but fantastic, y'all, and I appreciate each and every one of you for everything you've done for us, and looking forward to a lot of years here. Um, so he didn't introduce the kids. There's Lily and Grace and Harrison. He does claim them sometimes. Um, so we were looking for a church that uh, included the youth as much as the adults and made them a priority too. And we found that here uh, and just felt a sense of belonging from the first day we showed up. So. Uh, I'm Mark, and this is Elena Vollmer, my lovely wife, uh, Abigail and Madeline. Um, you may recognize Elena and Madeline. They're usually in the nursery helping out there, so that's kind of... Uh, it's kind of nice to see him out here. Um, I think the one of the main reasons, um, I, Carla wants me to say it's softball, why we're here, and she's all excited over there. Um, but really, it's truly much more than that. It, when I look out at this congregation, it's every single one of you. Um, you know, we all grow up, and people tell us how we should think and how we should act and what we should do. This church actually does it. This is truly something, whether it's the backpack program or the sports ministry, uh, that garage sale, everything, everything we've done, we've been welcomed like we've always been here, always been members. And again, it's seeing probably the closest anyone can come to seeing God's love in action. And truly, that's what we, that's what we want to do. And I can't wait to see what our other gifts can do to help out this community and help out change the world. Uh, just really excited to see it grow. So thank you. And softball, too. <laughs> I'm Kristen Muse, Matthew Muse. Isaac, uh, Matt, second grade, first. <laughs> this is Isaac and Liam Muse. We really enjoy the youth group here, like they've all said. And Isaac wanted to say that he really enjoys the music. 
All right, so friends, why don't you enjoy me in welcoming these new members to our church family. Thank you. You may be seated, friends, and we once more have cupcakes out there to celebrate and welcome new members. So please feel free to go out in the narthex, say hi to people, and grab a cupcake after the service this morning. All right, friends, I invite the children to come and join for the children's time, please. Come on up, everybody. Come on up, everybody, and join me. Come on. Oh, that's good hustle. I like that. Good hustle. Come on up. Okay. Friends, you ready? Gotta be more enthusiastic than the adults. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so glad to have you here today. This morning, the adults are talking about someone named David. Did you ever hear of David and Goliath? Did you ever hear that story before? It's about a boy who actually beats a giant. There's thunder and rain. Yes, there's thunder and rain. You can hear that too out there, yes. But this morning I'm talking about, this morning I'm, yes, this morning I'm going to talk about David for a minute, okay? And I'm going to read two stories about David this morning with the big people, with the adults today. The first is when David was just a young boy, God chose him to be the future king. So, um, and it says in there, in this, in this story, this passage of scripture, that God doesn't look at the outside of people. God looks on the inside. God looks at their heart. And that's so important because we often look at people and think of how old they are or how young they are or how um, big they are or small they are or something and think, well, maybe, you know, that person's too old for God to use or that person's too young for God to use. But you know that even if we're little, God can still use us to spread love even if we're young, right? God can use us to be full of love. It doesn't matter how young we are or how old we are. And so that is about how God can use anybody, that first passage. And the second one the adults are going to look at today is when David beats Goliath. He beats the giant. And you know what that passage tells us? That there's no problem too big for God to handle. There's never any reason for us to be scared or worried. If we think there's a giant problem in front of us, God is bigger than anything no, not, not only grown-ups can handle big problems sometimes, but kids can too because God is always with us. But we want to ask grown-ups for help, though, buddy. So um, we want to ask people for help, our grown-ups and God, because God is always with us. And God, just a minute, buddy. And so God is always going to help us beat the giants, okay? Any problem that we have, nothing's too big for God. And we need to know that as we're growing up because sometimes we have problems, okay? Everybody does. But God is bigger than any problem. So David beats Goliath because God is with him. And that's what we need to remember and learn from that. God is always with us. And we can. there's nothing that we need to be scared of because God's always with us. Okay? All right, let's say the prayer together, everybody. Dear God, help us to remember that you can use anybody of any age to be filled with your love. You can use kids. You can use older adults. You can use anybody. Help us to remember you can always use us. And help us to remember as we grow up, there's really nothing to be scared of because you are in our hearts and you're always there to give us what we need every day. And so there's no giant problem that we can face that we need to be scared of because you are always with us. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, good job. Everybody you can go back to Sunday school. And friends, as the kids head out, as you know, each week we take time to share joy and concerns with one another. You can see there's always a list of prayer concerns in your bulletin. If you'd like to add names to that, you can drop that on that insert. We said that goes in the offering plate, or you can contact the church office. We make sure that goes out on the email to everyone so they can pray for people, and it's added to the prayer request list in your bulletin as well. If there are others this morning, joys or concerns to share, please raise a hand, and Usher will bring a microphone to you. Good morning. Um, I just want to thank all of you for the prayers last week for <clears throat> my son, Jacob Holloway. Uh, we met with the surgeon 
and we found out that he will not need surgery on his shoulder. So thank you. Praise God for that. Keep, keep Jacob in your prayers as he recovers. Up front, Janelle, first. Ken Conklin was here this morning and had to leave. He had a medical issue. So if you can keep him in your prayers, he's going to meet with the doctors this week. And then also um, there's a girl at a Hubbard Church. She is how old, Samuel? I don't know where he went. Uh, she's like nine, I think. Um, she has, she's on your prayer list. She has leukemia. Her name is Autumn, and she's having a bone marrow um, test tomorrow. So if you can just keep Autumn in your prayers and Ken, please. I'd like to ask you to keep my wife, Judy, in your prayers. Uh, she went to emergency a week ago and uh, with trouble breathing and that, and they did a echo on her heart and she has some uh, congestive heart failure. And we're trying to get an appointment for a doctor in a Cleveland clinic to see her. So please keep her in your prayers. Thank you. So please keep Judy Green in your prayers. Are there others this morning? All right, friends, if not, um, from the ground, it's going to come forward and lead us in another song this morning. Again, we're talking about listening to God's voice and not the voice of Goliath, of the problems or of this world, So, but learning to listen to God's voice. And so our song that we're going to sing for us to prepare our hearts for prayer this morning is called You Say. in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low remind me once again just who I am because I need to know And when I don't belong, oh, you say 
Friends, you please join with me for a moment of silent prayer as we come to our God together in prayer today. Lord God, many of the people in this room this morning might not know that that song, that Christian song, crossed over onto popular radio just a few years ago and was a big song, not just on Christian radio, but on regular radio, because so many people need to hear the message that there's a God who made them and who loves them and speaks to them, and we can believe what you say to us, God, not what the world says to us, how it puts pressures upon us and puts us down and strives us against each other and makes us feel unworthy, like we're not good enough or we don't belong or so many things that the world teaches us, all the voices of the world that we listen to, speaking to us all the time on television or social media or radio or everything like that. But you say, God, that you love us. You say that we matter to you, that we are your children and you love us. And we need to listen to that voice. And so that song that was just sung for us became a song that's popular on regular radio for people to hear. Because, Lord, you do say that to us and people need to be reminded of that. We need to remind ourselves, Lord, and remind each other of the things that you say to us. Help us to remember that we are loved, that we are held, that we are all the things that that song just said, and so much more. For you love us in ways that go beyond our understanding. And we thank you that we can come to this place, Lord, and worship you, and come together as a family of brothers and sisters. So as people who just shared are becoming new members of the church, as they shared last week too, Lord, they can come here and find a place where people are really trying to put your love in action and not just have it be words that are said sometimes, but people really trying to put their faith, their love into action to help others. So bless our efforts, Lord, as we continue to do that in this place. Help us to be people who make it clear so that we say, Lord, what you say. We say it with our actions as we try to spread your love, we say it with our words as we repeat what you say to us, Lord, and we carry that message out into the world. Father, we pause this morning to pray for people who need your healing hand today. We pray for Jacob, for Autumn, for Judy, for Ken, for all those listed on our prayer request list, for the family of Pat Casarco, Lord, as she's passed and gone to be with you, and for all those, Lord, on the prayer request list in our bulletin and for others whom we name before you silently in our hearts. Lord, whether people need the touch of your healing hand or the strength and comfort of your Holy Spirit, Lord, we just pray that they would feel you with them in a strong and mighty way. And wherever it's possible, help us to be the answer to someone's prayer. Again, take us and use us to put your love into action so that anyone who needs to feel your love or know that you are real may somehow find it in us. And Lord God, we pray all these things together this morning in the powerful name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our Lord Jesus said that where your treasures, there your heart will be also. We will worship God at this time with the offering of our hearts and our treasures. And I apologize, there's a mistake in your bulletin, and the Ryder family will do the offertory for us this week, and Chuck will next Sunday.
Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, we give you our thanks, our praises. We gather here today, but we give you thanks in giving you this offering as well. We're giving back to you for part of what you've blessed us with, Lord. I pray you'll take it and use it to somehow bless someone else's life and show them your love. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. So again, I apologize. The internet is still down, I'm assuming, gentlemen. Is that correct? Okay, so I'm going to pick up a pew Bible. If you'd like to follow along, you can do so in a pew Bible. These are the ones that are down in front of you where the hymnals are there. i am reading two passages this morning. I'll read this first one uh, here before Samuel has to leave us to go to his other church. And this is where um, Samuel, uh, who we talked about last week, is going to anoint David. Um, God is speaking to Samuel and says, we need to um, bring a new king. Saul's time is done. I'm not speaking through him anymore. We're going to anoint a new king. And the one that's chosen is the youngest. It's David, the shepherd boy, to surprise. So I'm reading from Samuel 16. It's on page 277 in the Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. When they arrived, Samuel saw the oldest, Eliab, and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things the way that man looks at it. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has he chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. So that's the first passage for today. Samuel's gone to go to his next church. He's going to sing a song that uh, tells us a little bit about the story and what it means as part of the story of God choosing Samuel as a shepherd boy. One by one, the sheep sons stood before the prophet. Their father knew a king would soon be found. And each one passed except the last. No one thought to call him. Surely he would never wear a crown. Shepherd boy, God may see a king, even though your life seems filled with ordinary things. In just a moment, he can touch you, and everything will change. When others see a shepherd boy, God. One by one, problems come, dreams get shattered. At times it seems so hard to understand. But things like chance and circumstance, they don't really matter. Our Father holds tomorrow in his hand and when others see a shepherd boy God may see a king even though your life seems filled with ordinary things in just a moment he can touch you and everything will change 
When others see a shepherd boy, God may see a king. Well, it wasn't the oldest and it wasn't the strongest chosen on that day, but the giant fell and knees and trembled when they stood in his way. Just a moment, he can touch you, and everything will change. When others see a shepherd boy, God may see a king. Oh, God may see a king. Friends, would you please take a moment to pray with me and for me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So if you've been worshiping with us lately, we've been going through the Old Testament chronologically, one story after another, who the key people are, the stories, what we need to remember about them, how they still speak to us today. We started with Samuel last week and moving on in Samuel. The next key person that we come to is David. Now, you heard me say about a month or so ago, there's probably no one in the Old Testament as famous as Moses, talking about the Ten Commandments and leading the people through the river and all that kind of stuff. But if there is one other person maybe as famous as, as Moses, it's David. That's because the story of David and Goliath is so well known. We're going to look at that one in a few moments. You don't have to be a person of faith to know the story of David and Goliath. It's an analogy used all the time, right? The Guardians are going up against the Yankees now. It could be David and Goliath based on their payrolls or something like that, right? You know, it's the heavy favorite against the underdog. It's David versus Goliath. There's a lot more that we could say about David's life, and I preached on other parts of his life, his relationship with King Saul or with Jonathan. talked about Bathsheba before and all that happened with her. And it shows that David, like Moses or any of us, very human, made mistakes, but God can still do great things with people who make mistakes also. There's a lot we could say about David, but this morning I'm going to focus just on two main parts of his life, part of his story. And if one is the song that Samuel just sang for you, that in the scripture that I read for you, David's just a shepherd boy. The other brothers, they're bigger, they're stronger, and God's looking for someone to be the next king. But God doesn't choose. He doesn't look at the outside of a person, he looks at the inside. And he sees David, what's on the inside of him, and who he's going to grow to become. And God chooses David, and then David is anointed. And David, as Samuel just sung, is the one that goes on then and beats Goliath and becomes the king and does incredible things for God, even though he's just an ordinary boy. There's nothing special about David. He was an ordinary boy, shepherd boy, but God did incredible things with him, reminding us that God can do incredible things with us. That's the point of that story. Well, then that shepherd boy grows up, and he's going to become king later in the story. But first, you know David is going to face Goliath. I'm not going to walk you through this whole story this morning because the details of the story matter. They're important. And in order to understand this, we have to really understand this part of the story. Goliath never fights anybody. It's a long story. There's 50 verses. We're going to look at these together this morning. If you want to open your Bible, you can, or I'll just read it for you. But... It's a long story, but Goliath never fights anybody in the story. He never beats anybody. Instead, he just stands there day after day and threatens the people and acts like a big bully and tries to intimidate them. And Goliath wins day after day just by standing in front of the people and telling them, come out and fight me. I'm going to beat you. Okay? But he never does. He just has this loud voice that's scary and intimidates them. 
So before we read that scripture together, I'm going to tell you a quick story. A farmer came into town and asked the owner of a restaurant if he could use a million frog legs. The restaurant owner was shocked and asked the man where he could get so many frog legs. The farmer replied, there's a pond near my house that's full of frogs. There must be millions of them. They croak all night and they drive me crazy. So the restaurant owner and the farmer made an agreement. The farmer would deliver frogs to the restaurant 500 at a time for the next several weeks. The first week, the farmer returned to the restaurant looking rather sheepish with two scrawny frogs. The restaurant owner said, well, where are the frogs? The farmer said, I was mistaken. There were only these two frogs in the pond, but they sure were making a lot of noise. Those two frogs were loud enough to keep the farmer up at night. Have you ever been kept up at night by problems or worries telling you how big they were, how we should be worried, how we should be afraid? The voices we hear in our heads might seem so loud, they sound to us like a million frogs or something, right? They're so loud, but it's because they command our attention. That's what's really happening. They command our attention. But that's what happens with Goliath in the story of David and Goliath. Goliath was big, and he was loud, and he certainly commanded the attention of the people of God. Every day he stood in front of them with his loud voice and intimidated them and scared them. So I'm going to go through the scripture now and read it for you. And as I do, just listen and think about how Goliath may intimidate them, but he never actually fights or defeats anyone. If you want to follow along, I'm on page 278 of the Pew Bible. It's 1 Samuel 17. I apologize once more. The internet is down from the storm, so we don't have the slides for you today. But I'll be reading from the Pew Bible this morning. It's 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Dam in between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. Okay, so the Philistines oppressed Israel in every way at this time. They had an overwhelming presence in their lives. And they were lined up on opposite hills to go into battle, okay, with the valley between them. They're lined up opposite each other to go to battle. Israel's finally going to try to drive them out of their land. And then what happens is Goliath appears on the scene. So I'm going on with verse 4. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scaled armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod. Its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Basically, Goliath is this big guy covered this incredible armor, right? This incredible warrior standing out in front of them. Now, was Goliath really literally nine feet tall? I don't know, Shaquille O'Neal is a little over seven feet, right? Some people like that. People can get really tall. The point of the story, though, is he is big, he is strong, he is intimidating, okay? And they are scared. Going on in verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. He's going to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So Saul, King Saul, and the people are scared. They're terrified. No one wants to go out there and fight Goliath. Notice, though, no one has fought Goliath. What he said to the people is, come out and fight me, and I'm going to beat you. And that was enough for them to be scared. He's never done anything. He's never fought anybody. He's never defeated anyone. But just his presence and just his voice drives them into fear, depression, anxiety. And it says that they were immobilized. And so it is with us sometimes, right? When problems are in front of us, we can be immobilized by fear or depression or anxiety. It can happen to anyone still today, just like the people of God back then. So I'm going on with verse 12. David shows up on the scene. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, we just read that earlier, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war, the firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. 
three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. The next verse is verse 16 says, For 40 days the Philistine, meaning Goliath, came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Does a 40-day thing matter? It does because 40 days represents a time of trial in the Bible. Think of Jesus being tempted in the desert for 40 days in the wilderness or Noah on the ark that raining for 40 days and nights. The children of Israel wandering in the desert for 40 years. That's time of, that number 40 is symbolic of a time of trial. So the people of God are kind of facing a trial here. Goliath's in front of them. But again, for 40 days, Goliath doesn't fight anyone. He doesn't beat anyone. He's just a giant in their way, a powerful voice telling them, that he was going to beat them and God could not save them and no one had the courage to face him. So going on then in verse 17, David starts talking to people, finding out what's going on. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. There with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd, loaded up, and set out, as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. So David comes out, he sees Goliath for the first time. All the other people he sees are running around, running away in great fear. So going on to verse 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And they repeated to him, to David, what they'd been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's older brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done? Said David, can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. So David basically saying, I don't understand. Why isn't anyone going up and facing this guy if God is with us? I don't understand. Why aren't we doing this? And his older brother says, hey, shut up. You're just here to watch the battle. You're not going to go out there and do anything. Don't act like you are, okay? You're my younger brother. I know you, who you are, right? Basically, he tells him, to shut up, okay? But Saul here is about David asking this question. Hey, maybe there is somebody out there who's willing to fight. I hear this out there on the grapevine. So Saul sends for him. Going on in verse 32, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go, I will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. And he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. What is David trying to say to Saul? He's saying, I haven't lost hope. You've lost hope. I haven't lost hope because I know God is with me. How do I know that? Because God's been with me before. I fought a lion before. I fought a, I fought a bear before, right? I'm just a shepherd boy, but I've driven them off and protected the sheep because God's been with me before and God's going to be with me now. Now, He's reminding Saul of this, right? Saul the king, who's supposed to be the leader. But Saul's been immobilized in his tent, Scripture says, just like the other people. But David begins to tell him something different. God is with us. God's been with me before. God's going to be with me now. He's trying to plant a seed of hope again within Saul. That if he listened to David saying this, David would be able to beat Goliath. And so 
Instead of listening to Goliath, Saul began to listen to God again through David. Not the voice of the giant problem in front of him, but God's voice, the voice of truth, saying to him, God is with us right now. So then Saul tries to put him into his armor so he can face him. Going on verse 38, Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his own staff in his hand, his shepherd's staff, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in hand approached the Philistine. So what's happening, Saul's got a little hope, but he says, like, oh, you're just a boy. If you're going to face this mighty war, you need armor. So I'm going to put my own armor on you, this big stuff, the best we can give you. I'm going to put it on you so you'll be ready to go face Goliath. But it's not about the armor, right? It's not about anything like this of the world that can do it. What David needs is faith to believe that God is with him. Because it's not the armor that's going to beat Goliath. It's God acting through David that's going to beat Goliath. So David takes all those things off. He goes out to face Goliath, just a shepherd's staff, and with some stones and a sling that he's going to use as his weapon. So going on in verse 41, Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog? You come at me with sticks, meaning his shepherd's staff. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. He's talking smack, we would say today, right? That's what Goliath's doing. He's talking smack to this young boy. And David said to the Philistine, to Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today, I will give you the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know there's a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. Not because I've got some, right? Saul tried to give him this. Yeah, I don't have some big sword. I don't have some big shield. I don't have this armor. I don't need it. Because what I have is the Lord. The Lord is with me. You come at me with all your stuff, Goliath. It doesn't matter. The Lord is going to put you in my hands. Going on in verse 48, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from his scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Now the story ends, of course, you know this part of the story, with David beating Goliath, with him using a sling and a stone, and him simply throwing the stone with the sling into his forehead and killing the mighty giant. But that part of the story is actually anticlimactic, okay? Of course, David was going to beat Goliath. We know that because God is always with us. That wasn't the real battle. And that's the whole point of the story. The real battle was when someone stopped listening to the giants in front of them saying, here I am, I am big, I am scary, and I am going to beat you, and there's nothing you can do to overcome me. Come and face me and I will defeat you. Instead of listening to that voice, David instead listened to the voice of God, the voice of truth saying, that's not true. I am with you. Yeah, you're not going to beat it with a sword, with a shield, with some weapon, with your armor, right? But all you need is God. And if God is for us, what can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, right? Romans 8, right? Nothing can overcome us. If God is for us, then God is for us. So David knew that. And David listened to the voice of God. And so that was the real battle. Of course, David was going to beat Goliath. The battle was that he began listening to God again. Listening to God telling him, I am with you. I am always with you. So friends, again, how many times have we been lying in our beds at night, worrying about our health or the health of a loved one, 
or the loss of a job or any big problem, and we have real problems. I'm not saying they're not real scary problems. We all have them sometimes. But how long, how many nights have we listened to those voices, the voices of those problems, those giants in front of us telling us that they can't be beaten? And listen to them, and we're scared. We're almost immobilized sometimes. We're filled with anxiety or worry or fear. The message of David and Goliath isn't that a young boy took a stone and killed a, a, a giant. It's that a young boy had the courage to believe God could be with him. And he understood that if God was with him, nothing could stand in his way. That God would help him defeat any problem in his way. And so the real story is about David. We talked about last week, if you were here, about Samuel as a young boy learning to listen. Even though he was young, he had to learn to listen to God's voice. Today, it's still about learning to listen. David listened to God. Even though he was young, he listened and understood that if God was with him, nothing could be against him. And so we have to stop listening to those giants that we face sometimes in life, telling us they can't be beaten, that have us worried or mobilized or living in fear, and listen to God's voice instead, reminding us that God is always with us. You see, when people usually hear the story of David and Goliath, they think of the underdog against the heavy favorite, you know? They think of the shepherd boy against the giant. It's going to be the guardians now against the Yankees, right? There's a heavy favorite. There's an underdog. That's not what the story is really about. That's how we use it in contemporary society today. But this story is really about all these people who were God's people, who knew that God was with them, but when they faced the giant problem, were scared. They were mobilized by fear, and they wouldn't face the giant. God would have delivered Goliath into any of their hands. Anyone could have, defeat, could have defeated Goliath because God was with all of those people. But they didn't remember. They didn't believe, trust and faith strong enough that God was with them and that God would help them beat Goliath. The story of David is that someone believed. Someone had the courage to believe that God was with him. And so we need to have that kind of courage today. We need to believe. We need to remember that God is talking to us, reminding us all the time that God is with us every day. And no problem we face will ever overcome us because God is with us and will deliver us from anything we face. So we need to stop listening to Goliath. Stop listening to the voices in this world that tell us all the things that are wrong and all the problems that are out there that can never be overcome. And we need to understand that we need to listen instead to God's voice. Because God's voice is the voice of truth. God's voice is the voice that tells us, I am always with you. Nothing will beat you. Nothing will overcome you. I am always in you, beside you, with you, every step of the way. So let us stop listening to the voice of Goliath and listen instead to the voice of truth. Amen. Friends, just firm the ground who comes forward to sing a song for us to remind us about that. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, each one of us has times in our life when we have problems. We all do. It's part of being human. It's part of life, and we know that. But Lord, for the times when we're worried for ourselves or for loved ones, for the times that we're scared, help us, Lord, to stop listening to the voices of those fears, to the anxiety that causes the worry that causes and sometimes immobilizes us with fear. Help us to always remember to listen to your voice, Lord, the promises you are always with us and nothing can beat us. Help us to always remember to listen to your voice, the voice of truth. Amen. Friends, I want you to please stand if you're able. I apologize again. The words will not be on the screen as the internet is down, but I think you can listen to the words or sing along if you know it as we sing together, voice of truth.
is holding out his hand. But the waves are calling out my name and they laugh at me. Reminding me of all the times I tried before and failed. The waves that keep on telling me time and time again, boy, you'll never win. You'll never win. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says, do not be afraid. And the voice of truth says, this is for my glory. Out of all the voices calling out to me, I will choose to listen and believe the voice. Oh, what I would do to have the kind of strength it takes to stand before a giant with just a sling and a stone, surrounded by the sounds of a thousand warriors shaking in their armor, wishing they had had the strength to stand. But the giant's calling out my name and he laughs at me. Reminding me of all the times I tried before and failed. The giant keeps on telling me time and time again, boy, you'll never win. You'll never win. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says do not be afraid in the voice of truth says this is for my glory out of all the voices calling out to me i will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth if the stone was just the right size to put the giant on the ground the waves, they don't seem so high from on top of them looking down. I will soar with the wings of eagles when I stop and listen to the sound of Jesus singing over me. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth do not be afraid in the voice of truth says this is for my glory out of all the voices calling out to me I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth I will Listen and believe, listen and believe the voice of truth. Friends, that's exactly what David did. It wasn't that he could beat a giant in all its armor on his own. It's that he didn't have to because God was with him. And that was what the voice of truth told him. And that's what he believed. So many times in our lives, we forget that God is with us. We're immobilized sometimes by those giants. We listen to their voices instead. We need to listen to God's voice, the voice of truth, and carry that out to other people who need to hear that voice as well. And remember, they need to know God is with them. As you carry that message out into this world and believe it in your own lives, may the blessings of God the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord and Savior, and the peace and unity of the Holy Spirit be with you now, remain with you forevermore. Amen. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says do not be afraid. In the voice of truth says this is for my glory. Out of all the voices calling out to me, I will 
choose to listen and